director of creative writing at American University. And we're absolutely delighted to have as our guest this evening, uh, Adrian Mateka, celebrated poet, um, editor of Poetry Magazine, and uh, just all around wonderful person. And thank you all so much for coming. And City Bookshop is outside, our wonderful uh, independent woman-owned We good on the mic, good, thank you. So, uh, thank you, Marianne. Uh, thank you all, some familiar faces I see from the last uh, event. So thank you for, for coming back. And also thank you to Adrian, of course, for coming all the way from Chicago in the winter, although that's a bit, maybe a bit of a reprieve from the cold. I think some people are cold here, and I was thinking, don't say that to him, because coming from Chicago, you, you, he's not gonna acknowledge that <laughs> level of cold. Um, so, I don't know if any of you noticed, but there was a, I think, not this week, last week, there's an article about uh, the Cave Kano Foundation in the New York Times. And, uh, you know, I spoke to the reporter um, for about a half an hour about, you know, various things. And of course, the one thing they quoted me on was talking about playing basketball with Terrence Hayes. <laughs> and I'm like, really, after half an hour conversation, that's the one thing that she pulled out. Um, but what's funny about that is, is you know, playing, playing basketball at Cave Cano is also one of those first places where Adrian and I uh, interacted, because I think that was the place where we had that, some of those games. I always think it was you, Terrence, Daniel Wyman, um, Ross. Ross, somebody else <laughs> whose name I'm forgetting right now, and I, and I feel so bad. It'll come, it'll come back to me later. But it was interesting that we were starting talking about that downstairs, because one of the first things that I wanted to ask you, because um, I started the last conversation with Elizabeth Alexander talking about the tradition and lineage, um, and maybe a way of talking about that with you is to ask you what would be, or who would be in your poetry starting five? Um, and I don't mean in terms of like the, the dream team sense, like your, your Paranassus, but just like your solid five that you would be willing to, in a literary sense, you know, take to the pickup court at any time and know <laughs> you all would have a good artistic run of it. Oh, I love that. Thanks, Kyle. Hey, it's so good to be here with all of you. Thank you for showing up. I love that we get to hear hymns too. I, I really appreciate the way that you all are using this space. It's, it's beautiful and it's incredible. Um, when, when Kyle <laughs> said that, I'll do it like this. Um, when, when Kyle mentioned basketball, first of all, as he, as he said, we, we met at the basketball court at Cave Canem, which was amazing. Um, it's also where I met Ross Gay. Um, I already knew Terrence and a couple of other people there, but it was one of the most humiliating basketball experiences of my life because Ross Gay, who's about, you know, maybe 6'5", six, six, um, and has sh very sharp elbows. Um, <laughs> like, we were going, I was going up for a rebound, all 5'10 of me, and Ross was standing over me and elbowed me on the top of my head. And so it's always a shame when you catch an elbow as a basketball player, but on the top of your head is especially embarrassing because that means that they're just that much higher up than you, right, to, to be able to do that. So. I'm, I would put Ross <laughs> in my basketball, uh, my, my poetry starting five, not actually because of his skill, but because I just genuinely love the work that he does, both as a, a poet and an activist. I'd put Gwendolyn Brooks on that, because Gwendolyn Brooks is uh, a model for all of the things that I've tried to do. Um, I'd put Emily Dickinson on there, though I don't even think basketball existed when Emily Dickinson was around. Um, but I bet she could ball in the, in the poetic way, you know? Um, Terrence Hayes, of course, who is a, a dear friend, but also who else? Terrence Hayes. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. I, I genuinely believe he's one of the, the finest poets of our of our of our time. Um, and then one more. I, I get one more space. It's always that last spot. Yeah. That's tough. Um, probably Lucille Clifton. 
I think I'd put Lucille Clifton on there because I, so much of what I've tried to do as a poet anyway has been in the, in the footsteps. And then I'd put Kyle as the sixth, sixth man. <laughs> So, because you two, we were, we were talking about this downstairs. I, you know, I, I love poetry and I love poets, and I love in a different way the poets who make space for other poets. And Kyle is is one of those. And so, you know, that would be my whole team. Everybody except for Emily Dickinson made space for folks. Um, even though I did, <laughs> I did get the chance to write a poem in Emily Dickinson's bedroom. Um, the, the I was there for a festival. And uh, they were like, you know, we, they didn't have a lot of money. And so they were like, listen, we can, you know, if you pay your way, we'll let you um, have an hour in Emily Dickinson's bedroom. <laughs> and so I was so excited about this. I sat down, and the desk was like this big, and the chair was this big. And I was sitting on it feeling like I was going to break everything, you know. Um, and I wrote this poem, and I was so excited. And I read it after the, after the event, um, at, like, at the event at her, in her garden. It was only later that I had that moment where I thought, like, I, the last thing Emily Dickinson wanted would have wanted was me being in her bedroom, <laughs> like sitting at her writing desk, writing a poem. But she can still be on the starting five. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one day, who knows, someone may be writing poems at <laughs> a desk, desk of yours, and <laughs> you'll be in the beyond, and Emily Dickinson will be like, see, is that yeah, what it feels Exactly, or? that's what it feels like, right? Um, yeah. uh, I would like to get some poetry in the air. Um, and I was gonna, I was gonna ask you to start, um, actually, with the poem "Bullet Parts" mm. from somebody else sold the world. Mm. Given that, you know, we're we're just coming out of another uh, campus shooting mm -hmm. um, yesterday. But now, just with this conversation, I'm thinking like, well, maybe we can come back to that because unfortunately, that's going to be with us. Right. Um, and I was instead wondering if you could read for us the poem. How to Choose the Next City. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can do uh, that. Which is? So, um, thank you. I'm from the grand city of Indianapolis, and I lived um, in Section 8 when I was a kid. And a big part of what that was was us trying to figure out how to get out of Section 8 housing. And so this book, Maps of the Stars, is about that in some ways, about my, my family moving from the suburbs to, to the, or from the, from the very far east side of Indianapolis to the suburbs, which were on the other side of the city and out. Um, one of the great gifts of suburbs is they keep going. And in Indianapolis, there's nothing to stop them. So it was you know, probably a, an hour drive from where we lived to the suburb we ended up in, even though it was all considered Indianapolis. Um, and so this poem, How to Choose the Next City, was part of that, and it's also about basketball. So um, in the poem, I mentioned this kid named Garrett, who was my best friend, but also my nemesis when I was in third grade, fourth grade, when these poems are taking place. How to choose the next city. On another warm winter day, I'm stuck out on the court's fringes again, like Garrett's mother after she tried to run over her boyfriend while he stretched out near half court. She missed him but left the Chevy there anyway, idling and popping until the gas ran out. And I should say this is a true story. This person <laughs> tried to run her, her, her philandering boyfriend over while he was on the basketball court. So I'm going to go back up. She missed him, but left the Chevy there anyway, idling and popping until the gas ran out. We all laughed when her boyfriend rolled out of the way, then chased after her, apologizing for something. I'm out here, I'm on the outs again too, follow through fingers hitched below my bottom rib like a name buckle made out of knuckles. Borrowed ball parked in my elbow crook in Indianapolis, cracked backdrop of two, maybe three taller buildings, unrepentant above the tangle of empty trees where the older ballers smoked a joint between runs. My other hand, wrapped around the austere questions of cities we would have moved to if I could only grow and get my jumper right. Cincinnati, Chicago, almost Brooklyn, nearly Detroit, away from Indiana nearsightedness, away from hooping in slippery church shoes and getting picked the one after last, always next, 
always stuck on the crest of the court while the real ballers dribbled and jawed between relentless smack talk about busted jumpers, knockoff shoes, mamas and their respective fatness, all tangled in the sweaty pageantry as glimmering, as, as sticky as the mall jewelry they borrowed from each other to shine up for the girls who were on the side and pretending they weren't watching. A little city of gleaming gallantry, and I was too broke to get a spot in it. I'm sorry that I read that quickly. I, these words are coming back to me because I haven't looked at this book in a while. This is muscle memory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so one of the things I, I found really interesting about Map of the Stars, uh, at the poems in the book, is that the suburbs almost function like outer space, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, the speaker is trying to sort of get out of Section 8 in the center city to another place at the same time they're aspiring to be up in the stars mm -hmm. too, right? Mm -hmm. And I think this is true for, you know, a lot of your best poems, it's like everything is happening at the same time, like sort of the, the magical, the aspirational, um, the very real material, right? Um, it's all happening in the same place. So at the same time when you have this speaker who is aspiring just to get out of the city, which is a victory, he's also sort of like losing his grasp on the stars at the same time. Um, and I guess one question I had, maybe, well, I think it's true for some of the early collections, but definitely your later work, it seems like there's always a fairly strong conceptual through line in the manuscripts. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering, you know, do, do you think of yourself as more of a poem to poem poet or are you like a project book poet? Um, and if it is the latter, if you are more of a project book poet, is that more for you or is that more for the reader? Mm. That's a really wonderful question. I think during the time that Kyle and I have been trying to write, and, and you know, everybody in here has been reading poems or writing them, there's been a shift, I think, from collections that were like, this happened on a Thursday. Now here's a poem about a flower. Here's a poem about a song that I liked to a whole book about the song I like, or a whole book about the flower, which in some ways is an easier move if you're trying to pitch a book to be published, right? If you're thinking about how do I make legible a project that I'm working on to someone who might not care about poetry or care about that particular subject, you can build out a whole world around that idea, and that's a much easier, insofar as things are easy to sell ever in poetry, but it's a much easier offer as a book the best poems don't necessarily come out of that because the poems end up building on top of each other trying to circle a thing. Um, and so I, I think of myself as someone who writes poems based on the occasion or the moment, but then when I have a bunch of them, I realize I'm circling around something. So it's not really, a, um, it's not really about the project. It's about an obsession or, or, or something that I can't get out of my head. And then I've written a whole bunch of stuff around it the, only, the exception of that was um, Big Smoke. Big Smoke, that's yeah, what I'm but, but all the rest of them, like when I started writing Map to the Stars, I thought I was writing about learning to break dance and wanted to be a rapper when I was a kid, but somehow that smashed right up into I, I wanted to be an astronaut, but I'm so nearsighted that that wasn't an option, you know? Um, and we were also really poor, so, and I'm bad at math. There were a million things that were going to keep that from happening, but I didn't know that when I was in fourth grade, you know? And so I think that that, that's when I started to realize, and maybe that's what you mean, like sort of in the later part of things, I started to realize that it's okay to just keep circling a thing. And maybe some people use the idea of a bigger project as their circle, but for me it's just, if it keeps coming back to it over and over again, that's something I need to put some pressure on. You know? okay. um, and then, but again, though, the Big Smoke was totally different from the rest. Yeah, and I, I do want to spend some time talking about Big Smoke, because I, I think it does um, build on it itself so much. Yeah. Uh, in a way that it doesn't feel as though, oh, there are poems that are just here because they filled this role in the manuscript. It's like, it's all kind of building on this poetic exploration of Jack Johnson's life mm -hmm. and sort of the, the racial and political milieu that he lived in. Right. Um, so definitely want to get there. But it, there's a little bit of, the, of it in that poem. I wonder if you can get a, a bit more of the space element um, yeah. out of Map of the Stars before we, we move forward. And I think to that idea of like, you know, it's inescapable 
for you, but also for someone who's even an astronaut. So you, you go into that story of the first black astronaut. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and the fact that, right, like he's at NASA, he's going into space, mm -hmm. but at the same time, he's still two feet on the ground as a, a black man in America. Mm -hmm. So the, the poem that I'm thinking about is um, Ascendant Blacks. Yeah, yeah. And so the, the, I'm, I'm really glad that, that, that you mentioned this. So, so the first black astronaut was named Guy S. Bluford, and um, he went to outer space on August 30th, 1983. That's actually in the poem, so I'm just talking over myself, right? But um, at that same time, Purple Rain was the biggest album uh, in the world and also the, the, the best-selling movie, and I wanted to be like Prince when I was a kid, so that pops up inside of the poem, too, which is why I'm bringing that up. Um, when I came to my editor with this, the idea for this book, um, and I showed him some of the poems, he said, you want to write a book about Indianapolis <laughs> and outer space? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, and blackness, and also in rap music. <laughs> and he just he hadn't read the poem, so he didn't know what I meant. And then this poem was the one he read, and he was like, oh, OK, I get it now. I get what you're trying to do. I wanted to write a book that treated Indianapolis the way that New York poets treat New York, or Chicago poets treat Chicago like, you're supposed to know this. You're supposed to know that in this poem I mentioned Martinsville, which was the national headquarters of the Klan at the, in the early 20th century. And Kyle and I both had to drive through this town to get to Bloomington, Indiana, to, to the university. And so it was like one of these places where it was inescapable. And everybody in Indiana knows that it's still one of those grand pockets of racism, but nobody wants to talk about it. You don't stop for gas. <laughs> yeah, you don't stop for gas. That's like the first rule you learn of survival if, you, if you're at Indiana University is if you're coming through, you don't stop for gas. There are a lot of places you can stop before you get to Martinsville, but never there. All right. So Ascendant Blacks. The power was turned off again on Tuesday morning, and that, at, at the first morning I got my curl, and Guy and S. Bluford became the first black man in outer space. August 30th, 1983. I styled my wet front like 1999 prints, left side tucked behind the ear, dangling mesquite and activator in the same eye I would have used to telescope the Challenger as it flew over Kennedy Space Center in the midnight habit of black men trying to get out of Indiana expeditiously. In Indiana, any yellow brother could be an on-the-fly prince if he opened his eyes like two afterburners and hung his lips just a little. Even on the east side, where we all felt better in groups, even way over in Pike Township, where three pyramids rises majestically as cranial lumps after a beatdown, or in Martinsville, a town so precise with its epithet and buckshots, Bluefer wouldn't even fly over the place in the daytime. So when I gave this to, to, my, to, the, to them for copy editing and fact checking and all the rest of the very generous things they do, this thing about the pyramids, there's a, there's a uh, three buildings on the northwest side of Indianapolis called the pyramids, and they look like pyramids, but they're office buildings, they're awful. And they were right by where I used to play basketball at. So when I put them in a poem, the copy editors kept coming back, are these the pyramids of Giza you're referencing here? I'm like, nah, man, the pyramids of College Park. But if you're gonna do that, if you're gonna treat a space like everybody should know, then I can't say on 86th and Michigan, Avenue, uh, Mich Michigan Road in Indianapolis on the northwest side because that's unpoetic. So I just have to keep going back and forth and saying, no, not those, the ones in Indianapolis like it says. The whole poem is in Indiana. Why would the Pyramids of Giza be there? Mm -hmm. But I don't mean that disrespectfully to that, to that copy no, editor. Yeah, they're, they're doing their job. <laughs> they're doing their being, job. Being oddly literal. Um, <laughs> so in addition to just putting all of those subjects together, in one piece. Uh, for me, the thing about that poem is that as a poet, you use language to actually collapse them. Uh, so there's that line that always sort of catches for me where it's saying the eyes like afterburners, mm -hmm. right? And it's, it's there where it's, it's like, I, I often think of nowadays because we're talking so much about AI, right? right. Um, that really, you know, metaphor is a cognitive hack, right? Mm -hmm. That's like what poet, like we're, we're, we're sort of forcing you to understand something in a way that could take much more time if we were trying to just write the treatise, right? right? right but right. we can use language to sort of jump through those wormholes and say, okay, you're here now, but I'm gonna take you through this wormhole of metaphor and drop you off over here, and hopefully I didn't scramble your brain too much. 
that you get it. <laughs> yeah, and even if you don't even know the beginning part of it or the end part, if we do it right metaphorically, all of it comes together in a way that, that has value, right? And has, has movement like you're talking about. I mean, so much of what poetry does is transform and also transport, right? I'm a huge fan, we were talking about this earlier, I love space. Like, I love places, I love buildings, and the way that the architecture holds things. And metaphors are like a, a different kind of architecture that we can use to hold all of those ideas. I mean, I'm working from the assumption in that metaphor anyway, that, or that, that simile, that everybody knows who Prince is. And it's like one of those things that if you don't know who Prince is, I, there's nothing I could do metaphorically to help you. Right? Like, so hopefully Afterburners does something. Like you can imagine, if you don't know who Prince is, who is like if you've never seen his eyes with all his eyeliner and his like sort of you know, big stares and everything, then you can imagine that anyway. And it'd be enough to carry it. And, um, and if nothing else, everybody knows that version of, my mother got her hair cut like the Beatles after she saw them on the Ed Sullivan show. Um, and then got kicked out of school because of it. But what she was trying to do was, she cut it herself. She, what she wanted to do was she wanted to borrow that power from the Beatles, like borrow what she felt when she saw them. And the only thing she could imagine to do was to cut her hair. I think she'd be OK with me telling that story to people. Um, you know, she's, she's, a, she's, a, she's a fun one. But you know, we all, in one way or another, especially in our youth, borrow things trying to figure out who we actually are. And I just was lucky enough to have somebody like Prince to be there in his high heels and makeup <laughs> to try to ha try to figure out like that's what I want. That's yeah, the power and I want. It's interesting because you know the figure in the poem, the speaker can try to borrow the power of Prince, right? right? But the actual astronaut can't take all the power of NASA wherever he goes. Yeah, it's not with them. You know, it's a, it was never that was never it was never bequeathed the guy in blue for it. And he's still alive. Um, and at some point in the process of this we thought about trying to like contact him to see if he wanted to talk about it. And when we were trying to do it, we found his agent and his speaking agent and everybody else and we couldn't get to him. Mm. You know, just to say, hey, I'm writing poems and you're in them. I'd really like to talk to you. Um, and they're like, okay, so it costs this much to talk, you know, in, in respect, like he needs to protect himself, right? Um, but even that part of it, like, the absence of structures around him, the absence of protection around him back then had to inform later on how he would have dealt with things, right? When you get left out there by yourself for a while, it's very easy to just close in. And, you know, and I'm make, this is all supposition. I have no idea if that's true or not. But it felt to me like NASA wasn't taking care of him. You know, the space program wasn't pr protecting him or supporting him. He was uh, trotted out and then sent on his way. Right. You know? Hyper visible, but no protection. Yeah, hyper visible, but no power whatsoever. Yeah. Um, since you were, you were bringing up architecture and art uh, a little bit, I had a question uh, related to bat to basketball and other mm -hmm. things. So, I, as first of all, do you would you consider basketball and boxing art forms? I think all sports, except for maybe MMA, are art forms, and that's just me being a boxing fan. Um, basketball, certainly. Right? I mean, all you have to do is watch. Maybe not Giannis. We were talking about the Bucks earlier, not, not him, perhaps. But um, watching Michael Jordan, for example, and the, 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 the movement of someone, the, the obligation that you would have to, you, the, to, to be both fluid but precise but imaginative, it's, almost, it's more like jazz than it is a sport to me when you watch someone who plays like that. Um, boxing, it's never about the punches. It's all about everything in between that gets, the, gets ready for the punch. And so the least violent part of the sport is the best part to me, right? That's the artistic part of it. Um, and I think boxing is the closest thing to poetry, too, because of the cadence of it. Much, much more so than basketball. As much as I love to write about basketball or write versions of basketball in my poems that I wish I was, um, it's boxing that, that has voltas, and it's boxing that has form, and it's boxing that has these other things. It's also boxing that's played itself and is um, 
once upon a time was the most popular sport in the United States and in the world. Um, but pay-per-view, changing understandings of CTE and, and like the way that violence builds out from someone or builds out and builds inside of them has made it less inclined. But football's still fine, right? Yeah, so yeah. my follow would then be, um, so there's a, a type of poetry, sort of a term some of you may be familiar with, uh, ekphrasis, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of writing about art, mm -hmm. um, descriptive writing about art. There are different ways you can look at it. Um, I personally like to think of ekphrasis as using writing to extend another work of art in some way. Mm -hmm. So then my follow-up question to you is like, do you feel like your writing about boxing and basketball could be considered a form of ekphrasis? You know, that's a really great question. I, I think it is. I think a lot of what I do is crisis too, though. You know, um, for me, when I'm writing a poem, it's, it's never because I feel like I need to say something and it's so important that other people need to hear it. It's always because there's a question that I'm trying to answer, and the poem is the only way I can figure out how to do that. And a lot of the questions I have are about the space around me and the space around us. And so it would make sense. And, you know, my questions about boxing or why am I, why am I not a little taller? Um, my, <laughs> basketball, excuse me, my questions about boxing are, you know, uh, why am I not a little tougher? Uh, because my father, my biological father wanted me to be a boxer and I got in the ring one time, got punched in the nose once and I was like, nah, <laughs> this doesn't make sense. You know, like eight year old me was just like, this actually doesn't make any sense at all. Why would I stand here and get clipped in the nose for what? And then this is going to happen again in a little bit. <laughs> no, I'm good, right? But looking at those sports as a, um, as a springboard for a larger conversation or something that can transform the way I think about the world, absolutely. I mean, I, so much of my life, there was a point before my, around the time my daughter was born where I think that there hadn't been more two, than two or three days in 25 years that I hadn't been on a basketball court. Like, it was just what I did. It's how I cope. It's the thing that brought me the greatest joy. And then, you know, so it was the lens through which I was dealing with the world, whether I understood it or not. And I never wrote about it, though, because the person who I had to leave out of my basketball starting five plus one was Yusuf Komanyaka. And Yusuf wrote a poem called Slam Dunk and Hook. And that was it's still the best poem about basketball that I've ever read, except for Ross's Beholding. And that doesn't, doesn't work as a book-length poem, so that doesn't really count. Um, but when I, read, when I read the way that someone else could approach this thing, the way that someone else could codify this, this, um, this art disguised as athletics that I, that I loved so much, it, you know, I didn't feel like I could write about it again, but I always had it in the, in the forefront. You know? It really was 28 years after I read Slam Dunkin' Hook before I put the word basketball in a poem. 28 years. That's how good Yusef's poem is. Anybody who likes basketball, well, if, you should read Yusef Komenyaka anyway if you don't, haven't read his work, but anybody who's interested in this, Slam Dunk and Hook is genuinely one of the finest poems I've ever read and happens to be about basketball. Yeah. And what's interesting about it is I, I don't, I mean, I sort of know Yusef, of course, like as an older man. Yeah. Um, but like I've never had a conversation with Yusef about basketball. <laughs> Or if I were to see him, right, it's yeah. not the first thing that comes mm -hmm. to my mind. But I know he wrote that poem. Yeah. And that's really all I need to know. Yeah. Um, and it, it is a great poem. You can sort of look it up online uh, when you get home if, if you want to. Uh, so to shift to, to boxing mm -hmm. a bit, because uh, we know you, you have this book, The Big Smoke, which was a, a finalist for the National Book Award. But you also have the graphic novel, too, um, thinking about exorcist, right, mm -hmm. sort of taking the Jack Johnson story, sort of language and art in a different direction. Um, but you, you all have one poem from the book um, that you know, I, I want to, I try to every one of these events to walk through one poem thinking about small decisions because I think that's the, the sort of thing that people on the outside of a poet's mind don't often get to do. Yeah. Like we just see the whole, but we don't take the time to think, well, what happened here? What happened here? Like, why is this like this? Mm -hmm. So I want to do that. But the thing is that I think the, the Shadow Knows poems, which is sort of a series throughout the book, build on other things in the book. Right. So I guess before we, we get to that, 
I wanted to give you an opportunity. And it's sort of tough for me because like there, there's so much in this book that I appreciate, so I couldn't really pick. So I wonder if you would be willing to sort of like maybe just pick a poem or two of sort of introduction from The Big Smoke before we talked about um, that poem yeah, in yeah. particular. Thank you. And, um, yeah, I'm really glad to, to come back to this because I've been, since February, reading from this graphic novel. Um, and it's, it's a very different thing. You know, thinking about a crisis, it's like to write a poem, to write, th this whole book is monologues. And you know, in one way or another, and to write monologues requires one kind of imagination. But if you try to write a monologue and then there's pictures with it, then you're contending with both of those things. And so, in the book, in a monologue, if Jack Johnson says something like, "I just lift this guy up," that's one thing. But when you say see him say that and do it, the violence is rendered very differently, right? It sounds like a story when somebody's telling you it. It's like a movie and seeing somebody get punched in the face in the, in the graphics. So, the, um, so this entire thing is about the first black heavyweight champion of the world, Jack Johnson. And with the exception of the shadow poems, everything in the book is true, happened, and is attached to what facts that I've built out in the eight years it took me to write it. And so I think the first poem where you get an a sense of who Jack Johnson is, and then maybe one other will help set this up. And I can talk a little bit about the series, and then we can go from there. Um, yeah, this is definitely a book that b tries to build on itself. If I could have written a novel, it would have been that. But what I do is I write poems, and that's how I hear them. And so, so the first poem in the book is called Battle Royale. And if any of you have read Al Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, the, the unnamed narrator, ends up in one of these battle royales, but essentially it's just they throw a bunch of people in a ring, and whoever's standing is the winner at the end of it. But in this case, when Jack Johnson started, they blindfolded all of them because they thought, that they thought it was funnier to do that to these young black men and then put them in the ring. Um, I feel like I want to say a little bit more. Is that OK? Do we have time? OK. So Jack, like I said, Jack Johnson was the first black heavyweight champion of the world. He um, won the title in 1908 by being this guy named Tommy Burns. And Tommy Burns was 5'7 and 170 pounds, and Jack Johnson was 6'2 and 240. And so it wasn't really a fight. He quit school in third grade to, to go make money like people did in the early, in the early 20th century. Um, but he, Shakespeare was his favorite author. He taught himself how to speak. Italian, he played classical veal, he trained himself to be this different kind of person. That all matters because it's in the poem. Um, Battle Royale. <clears throat> Back then, they chain a bear in the middle of the bear garden and let the dogs loose. Iron chains around a bear's neck don't slow him too much. A bear will always make short work of a dog. Shakespeare said Sackerson did it more than 20 times to dogs and wild cats alike. And since most creatures are naturally afraid of bears, there wouldn't always be much of a show in the bear garden. So the handlers sometimes put the bear's eyes out or took his teeth to make the fight more sporting. I believe you need eyes more than you need teeth in a fight, but losing either makes a bear a little less mean. Once baiting was against the law, some smart somebody figured Kellys would fight just as hard if hungry enough. So they rounded up the skinniest of us, had us stripped trousers, then blindfolded us before the fight. They turned us in hard circles a few times on the ring steps like a motor car engine before pushing us between the ropes. When the bell rang, it seemed like I got hit from eight directions. I didn't know where those punches came from, but I swung so hard, my shoulder hadn't been right since, because the man said, only the last darky on his feet gets a meal. All of that is true. So he started the first fight he ever had. He got paid food. <coughs> they put him in this ring, blindfolded him, and threw him in there, and he won. And he didn't think anything twice about it, because after that, when he became heavyweight champion, he would referee these battle royales. Like, that's how you, that's how you did it. Um, um, the other poem I think would be good to read is a poem called Sporting Life. And this poem, Sporting Life, the entire thing is a direct quote. I just added a couple of conjunctions and articles and some line breaks to make it look like a poem, but it's just something that he said. Um, so at Jack Johnson's time, the sporting life was the lifestyle around boxers and uh, gambling and sex workers and 
you know, like late night parties, like that whole thing was the sporting life. So the people, who, the men who participated were called sports, the women were called sporting women, and the life was called the sporting life. Sporting life. People are always talking about if and suppose like those words are worth more than money, more than the crease a silk stocking makes on a woman's thigh, more than the grumble of a Thomas Flyer engine. So I take the side of my pleasure, two small words, if and suppose, and nobody can explain them. We get in this world what we're going to get. After all, one man can roll out of bed and be killed while another man falls from a scaffold and lives. A man can get a bullet in the brain and keep his life while some other poor sap, he dies from a shot in the leg. It's all luck and perspective. Pleasure is both to me. So that's what Jack Johnson actually sounded like. And in the newspapers, they had him sound like a minstrel. They would change his language so that he seemed less intelligent than he was. They, you know, since photographs were so expensive, they'd do these illustrations of him being chased by a lion with a bone through his nose and all kinds of just horribly racist stuff. And so there's a version of that in this book. There's a much more direct version of it in the graphic because we took some of those cartoons, those illustrations, and put them in the book. And that was, those are a hard four pages to deal with for me in that book. But they, it seemed important because when you see it, it seems so insane that the Dallas Morning Star would publish something that racist, or the LA Times, but it was just how it was in 1910. Everybody, you know, the, the entire institution was treating Jack Johnson that way. Well, I mean, also speaks to like the, the psychic trouble of trouble mm -hmm. of having to deal with suddenly a black figure mm -hmm. atop of this, you know, mountain which you never perceive, you know, there would be anyone else but Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at that time, being a heavyweight champion was to be the toughest, most you know, well-known person on the planet. And so that made Jack Johnson one of the wealthiest, other than I mean, Madam C.J. Walker, you know, um, one of the wealthiest black people in the world, um, and also the most infamous, probably, black person in the world because everybody knew who he was. All the way to President Roosevelt, like former President Roosevelt at that time, who wanted to get rid of boxing rather than have a black heavyweight champion. Uh, Jack London and Call of the Wild and all that stuff. He was the one who initially came up with the idea of calling for great white hopes. You know, um, He was so um, abhorrently racist and was just like, you know, we can't have this. We need you guys, to, somebody needs to beat this man. And so every day Jack Johnson's dealing with all of that. And so, in, um, his experience, while it was extraordinary um, because of the, the, the celebrity of it and the scope of it, was no different from anybody, any other black person at that time. He just had more money and there were more people looking at him. You know? And so that was, he never really understood that, which is where the shadow poems come in. Like his understanding of his position was so different from the way that other people treated him. You know, to have those two things, your self-worth, your self-awareness and self-value bump up against the culture and like in the institutions of a nation who were built to keep you from having anything. You know, I probably should have said that Jack Johnson's parents were enslaved, so he's the first generation after emancipation. So when I say that the systems were built, I mean, we have our version of that right now, but it was a very different and immediate. I mean, this is all Jim Crow, it's all reconstruction. And here's Jack Johnson with gold teeth married to a white woman with five cars and resplendent suits running around. Absolutely. It's, it's amazing. Like, it's brilliant and phenomenal and also a miracle that he didn't get assassinated. You know? Well, I guess on that, that note of the double consciousness, let's get to the, the shadow yeah, uh, nose yeah. poems. Um, yeah. So this is the last one in the book. Mm -hmm. Um, so there are a series of these throughout the book. This is the last one. After his, after his major fight and sort of between that and his sort of eventual, I want to say downfall, mm -hmm. but just sort of like the winnowing sort of of his career yeah. um, and, and prowess. And I'm going to let you say a little bit more after it, mm -hmm. but I guess you just read that one first and, and, and mm -hmm. we all have it. And then yeah. So just, just for context with this, um, and thank you for that frame, Kyle. Um, for context for this, the poems are, some of them um, are Jack Johnson talking to his shadow, 
uh, shadow responding. And some of them are the shadow talking to Jack Johnson. And this is the one where the shadow is talking to Jack Johnson. Um, yeah, and in fact, it's one, the only one where Jack Don Johnson doesn't say anything back. The shadow knows. I know this isn't how you thought things would go when you were joyriding Wabash Avenue and the flyer, all those white women hanging out of your auto like streamers at a party. I bet you imagined you'd always be the Galveston giant, the champion Negro drinking champagne with your breakfast eggs, a cigar huffing like a smokestack, a straight sport, even in old age, white three-piece on the bed where Etta carefully laid it. You could see it all then, like one of those burlesque shows in Paris. Come on now. White folks didn't like you before you whipped Jeffries, and black folks lost appreciation for your golden magnanimousness the minute you, your gallivanting got somebody killed. Satisfaction is its own cold consequence. Hate to tell you, but that gorgeous left hook don't mean a thing to the agents in their man act. You're going to jail and dragging me with you. What's the guff, Mr. Heavyweight Negro? No repartee now that the law is kicking at your door? Um, and I think that ending also speaks to a, another really big part of the book mm -hmm. is the, the domestic violence and abuse mm -hmm. um, that was a part of Jack Johnson's life and how that mm -hmm. kind of caught up. That was the thing that eventually caught up with him via the Man Act. Yeah, um, yeah. But so some, some questions about the construction of this poem mm -hmm. and the decisions that you make. So the first thing why I thought this was such a brilliant approach in this book so I'm assuming that the idea of the shadow comes in part from shadow boxing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and it, if some of you sort of re remember, if you've seen it, uh, I think it's Creed. Um, <laughs> but there's, there's one moment in Creed where uh, Michael B. Jordan is sort of fighting in the mirror. And mm -hmm. uh, Sylvester Stallone comes up to him and says, you know, that, that guy in the mirror, that's your toughest opponent. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, it's, it's the shadow that is Jack's toughest or sort of like most uh, piercing critic mm -hmm. because the shadow knows mm -hmm. all of these things. So first of all, I, I thought it was a, a really great choice to take from the boxing motif, mm -hmm. right? Because like, you know, one of the things I'm always telling my students is like, if you're gonna write about something, really work with its motif. Right. So like choosing to work with shadow boxing as, as part of that um, really interested me. So formally, my question is, is it all one long stanza because that's the way that shadows look. <laughs> Thank you, yes. I was trying to imagine what, um, you know, I've never tried to write concrete poetry, but I imagine all the time that the, the space on the page is a kind of geography, right? And if we can shape that geography, there's a way to make it um, speak, even if it's just like sort of subconsciously to, to the work we're trying to do. And um, yeah, that happens throughout the book, right? The, there are three voices um, in the book of Jack Johnson's wife, Etta, and then his two mistresses, Hattie and Belle. And each one of them has a different kind of poem, and the shape of it is different. And I wanted it to look different, and unlike anything else in the book. So if you hit that page, you know who it is that's talking before you even get, in, get engaged with who it is. I want you to be able to visually respond. And so the Shadows poems look a little bit like Jack Johnson's, but they're thinner and longer, and that's what I was trying to imagine. But I think you're the only first person who's ever brought that up. So yeah, um, that is it. I wanted them to look like the long shadow that you have to fight. OK, I, could, I can see that. Mm -hmm. um, another thing, so I'm, I'm big on line breaks, although mm -hmm. I'm kind of reaching a point where I don't know if the average reader cares as much about line breaks nowadays mm -hmm. as maybe they did in the past. Right. And then I always had to just square up with the fact that, well, I always did it for me, ultimately. Mm -hmm. Like, it was my relationship to the way I wanted the poem mm -hmm. to look on the page. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I noticed when I looked at this poem, thinking about boxing, mm -hmm. and this may not have been as intentional, maybe it is in some places, but you were talking about the rhythm of boxing right, and how the rhythm of boxing is most like poetry. And what I find is when I look at the ending words on each of these lines, they're all sort of like meaty, punchy words. And like every word at the end of the line more or less feels like a stiff jab. Um, and I'm wondering if, if you had that in mind at all, so you're thinking about how you were deciding where to 
in the lines for this poem. I mean, you all can look at it. Look, look at the poem and look at the words at the end. It's very rare that it's just like an article or a conjunction or something like that. It's all sort of very weighty words that end each line. Yeah, you know, I, 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 do, I think about that a lot, right? And I think about it just not only as the, the, the end of the line, but also the beginning of the next line. So if you imagine a line break to not just be the, the thing at the end, but the thing at the end and then at the, the beginning of the next thing too. So it's like a one-two, not just a and the place where that kind of thing falls apart is that I have a great enthusiasm toward these kind of polysyllabic words and, you know, like magnanimous and gallivanting and satisfaction. And they don't punch like that. They're like a whole tumble of things, right? But early on especially, you get the one, two all the way, all the way through. Um, and these, and these shadow, the Shadow Knows poems, I guess I, I should say this, the, uh, the other poems that are Jack Johnson's off in the Shadow are called Shadow Boxes. Right, so they're kind of in conversation, and his line breaks are different from the ones that are in the show. Or I tried to make them different. Um, yeah, to keep a cadence, right? To keep a rhythm. We think about the way that boxers, for those of you who are invested in this in that way, boxers train both. You know, their their stamina, they train these things, but they train in rhythms. So it's like one, two, three. You see, when you see it in a movie, or if you you know, they've got the little punch, like the the mitts that get punched, and it's all these different patterns. How do you render all those different patterns in a poem? It's got to be word choice because that's all that we have. Right? Uh, can I say something about how this, these poems started? And I'll, I'll keep it tight because I don't remember much time. That's cool. Um, so I had. Can go a little bit, a little bit over. Okay. Um, so my um, these were the last poems I wrote in the book. So it, 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 it was eight years from beginning of research to the end of the book, like when the book was in the world. Eight years, and I was doing a residency, one of the only residencies I've ever done in Texas, randomly, where Jack Johnson's from. And um, I was reading through what I had, and all the poems were like, I don't know, sporting life, like that poem where he's talking about how he's a winner, talking about his successes. There's nobody in the book pressing on that. There's nobody in the book questioning his version of things. And it reminded me of Miles Davis's autobiography that he uh, wrote with Quentin Troop, where Miles Davis Brilliant Miles Davis is the winner all the time. In third grade, he won the trumpet contest. You know, he's the fastest kid in class. Every he wins every time. Even when he was an addict, he's still somehow winning, right? Because he's driving a Maserati as an addict. And so I was reading through this version, and it felt a little bit like that. Like Jack Johnson was always winning, and there was nobody pushing back against him. And so I had this idea: was like, well, what if, like you're talking about? What if the motif is shadow boxing, and the only person he's around all the time is his shadow, and he can speak to his shadow, and his shadow will speak back? And I thought about Richard Pryor's character Mudbone, who talks to Richard Pryor about all the mistakes Richard Pryor makes, or talks about them. And I was like, okay, that's what it can be. It can be like this weird version of Mudbone. And forgive me, but at that moment I was like, man, this is brilliant. I am so smart. This is such a cool thing. And then I remembered that at Cave Canem, I was talking to the great poet Marilyn Nelson, and I was talking to her about this project, and she said, you know, I always had this idea about, you know, a poem where somebody was talking to their shadow and their shadow talked back. And she's like, honey, you can have that idea. And, I, and at the time, I was like, that's a terrible idea. That has nothing to do with Jack Johnson. Six years later, <laughs> after I'd caught up a little, a little bit of what Ms. Nelson was trying to teach me, I was like, but I thought it was my idea. <laughs> and, and like, you know, and like in so many of the ideas I think I had, it was bequeathed to me by somebody who's much more on point and brilliant than I'll ever be. And so Marilyn knows this now. I was like, yeah, uh, maybe I wasn't as direct about thinking it was a bad idea at the time because it really was one of those things where I needed to level up, you know, before I could understand what a gift she'd given me. And so yeah, just like seven years later, six years of carrying that idea around, and I recognize. And that's the kind of generosity a great teacher will have, is oh. just to say, you can just. Yeah, you can have that. I've got so many ideas, you can take this one. And it was perfect. Yeah. Perfect and then right on cue, I remembered who that last person on the basketball court was, Indigo Moore. <laughs> that was it. And so that just jogged my memory. Um, so I, I know I, I wanted to spend as much time as we could just discussing your work, because I, you know, I think you know sometimes you become a figure at the top of an institution and people kind of forget that you're an artist too. So I definitely wanted to take that time. But 
I also do want to talk about the fact that you are the editor of Poetry Magazine, and that's a thing. <laughs> um, I guess maybe some quick questions. Just I, one, so in a, I think it was an interview with The Millions, you talked about the fact that, you know, growing up, you know, you, you never even imagined yourself sort of submitting or getting published in Poetry Magazine, you know, let alone becoming an editor, right? Um, and so that in some ways, like you, you becoming editor from that context may feel like a little unfathomable or like unpredictable. Um, but at the same time, you know, from the outside, I would say knowing some of the challenges that Poetry Magazine has had over the years with representation, that it would make sense to me actually that poetry might want someone like you at the top um, for who you are and what you do, but also for some atonement, right? Um, and I guess my, my question is, like, I know you have all that weight on your head and your shoulders. And so as Adrian Matika, editor of Poetry Magazine right now, how do you balance maybe that expectation to correct with sort of doing the kind of work that just from this moment we're in right now, you imagine you want the magazine to do going forward, which may not necessarily be as directly concerned with that type of correction. So my, um, so I'm the, you know, obviously the first black editor, full-time editor of the magazine. There, were, there, there have been a few other editors of color in um, associate editor positions. We had a guest editor, Ashley Jones, um, not that long ago. So all, you know, so there's a version of this, but I'm the first uh, editor in chief who's who's uh, not been a white man or Harriet Monroe who founded the magazine. So we had 20 years of Harriet Monroe running this, not even 20, like 14 years of Harriet Monroe running this, and then it was all white men until 2022 when I, um, when I, was, when I retired. So there's a, there's a lot of things to think about in that, in that history and a lot of things to kind of grapple with. The poetry is, of all the arts in my mind, the one that simultaneously, is the most simultaneously past and present. Um, it's the one that's always attending to and dealing with the past while it's also trying to figure out what it might do later. I mean, maybe rap music that used to do that when used sampling to, was yeah. a, a, a bigger part of it. But poetry is like the one that's always on time and also timeless at the same time, right? So walking into that space, I knew there were many things I needed to do to attend to the past, but I wanted to create a space that would also attend to the present, you know? Um, and so we created these folios of poets who were never in the magazine before. And the first one was a poet named Carolyn M. Rogers, who was part of the black arts movement from Chicago, co-founder of Third, uh, Third World, World Press, Press, the oldest um, independent black publisher in the world. And she'd never been in the magazine. She was a National Book Award finalist, but was never in the magazine. You know, Gwendolyn Brooks, the great Gwendolyn Brooks, was only in the magazine a few times. We Real Cool was there, you know. Um, but for the, the, the scope of her career, she was hardly in the magazine at all. First time I was in it, in 2012, and this has absolutely nothing to do with that editor, he was, he was really great to me. Um, in my mind, I, I thought I was in there with Kevin Young, like the two of us were the two black poets. Kevin wasn't even in there, it was just me. It was just me. There were no other poets of color. It was in a, it was in a magazine that was almost exactly 10, published 10 years before I took over. And so knowing that, both as a practitioner, that this place wasn't welcoming, um, and also a student of poetry and an editor, I knew that there was a kind of work that was going to ha that have to defy the expectations of it. It couldn't just be, well, look, let's just open up the pages and publish people. That's not enough. You know, especially when people, the, those poets have already started to find their way, they've found their, started to find their way into the pages before I got there. You know, John Sherry was doing a lot of that work. The guest editors were doing a lot of that work. So it was already starting to happen. But what it needed to be was having this huge like cruise ship moved off of its, its kind of crea its editorial and philosophical space, not just current, but moved into a whole other sea of sorts that didn't think about it as representation, but imagined the different kind of editorialism that is about the best poem, 
Because if you do that and you open up your eyes, you're going to get like this enough room for every kind of color, and all kinds of formal, less formal, all of it. But you have to be willing to just read and read through, not just because I'm trying to be careful because I never want to be disrespectful to the experience of the writers. But my understanding is previous editors in chief would put the book, t the whole thing together by themselves. So they would do all of this reading and writing and, and, and try to create this space all alone. And that would be, that is so unfathomable to me. Not, beca not only because I don't trust myself to do that kind of work, but the sheer labor of it. The sheer labor of reading everything and picking everything up. 12 issues a year, that's 400, 500 poems, and we get 12,000 poems a month. So trying to imagine how one would hold themselves together. And they're, all, they're poets, too. Like, how are they going to write their own poems? Like, so when I came in, I knew none of that was going to happen for me. I knew that our editorial team was going to be created in a way that all of us would be in the room talking about it, not just because that's the best way to edit for me, but also because I need that help. And I need those perspectives to, to keep me from trying to create a thing that is all Cave Cave. You know, or Three Young Leaves you know, on every page. Like, there are people who I love so much, and if I saw their poem, I'd immediately want to take it. But sometimes those aren't the best poems. Sometimes those poems mean something to me because I love their work. Or, you know, and I've got other people on my team who maybe don't love their work, so they see this as maybe not the best offering from that poet, and we need to ask them. That's a really long-winded answer. I'm sorry. No, no. It's, I think um, it's not just like changing the direction. It's like reorienting the thing entirely, and that's not something. It's I'm not even to two years yet. It's like been like eighteen months. Um, it's going to take the. I told him five years for my time there because I got to get back to poems. It's going to take the entire five years at least to do the kind of thing that I'm trying to do in terms of just fundamentally changing. All the support I could ask for in the building, all of that, it just, it's going to take time. You know, it's going to take a lot of time. So, everybody, know that if you want to submit, this is a good time to do it. Because we're all reading, we're all thinking about the work that you're doing. We're thinking about it individually as you, not, and whether or not we read your work or not. Like, this is the time. We're trying to uh, make you know, they, they record this and put <laughs> yeah. it on the internet. So, just, I tried to warn you before we, because it's too late now. Yeah. Yeah, so um, if you see this in three years, it's not the same answer. <laughs> it's not the same offer, but yeah, no, I mean, it's, but it's true, right? I mean, we're trying to figure out a way to make this a space that people want to engage with, not because it's 111 years of Poetry Magazine, but because it's this version of Poetry Magazine, the one that's been trying to be enacted for the last three or four years. I, I have one more question, but I, I know people are only expected to be here till eight, so I don't want to keep. All right, so last question. Um, I did also want to ask a question about, you know, AI and poetry submission, because that's just going to be a thing at some point, but we'll put that one. <laughs> um, so I, I, I have a really hard time of knowing where poetry is right now in the American consciousness. Um, it feels very different. Like, I'd say for the last 20 years, I could have a beat on, okay, I kind of have a sense, like, what poets are getting picked up, what people are looking at. Right now, I have zero idea. I have zero idea. Also, I, I talk to my students, and I ask them, what do they read? They're not reading books. Um, they're picking up poems here, right there on the internet, which is fine. Like, I don't disparage that. I just know it's a very different type of consumption than what, and I'm also thinking about, well, if they're not reading books, who's reading the books? Um, so I, so I, I really, I don't, like I wouldn't know what to tell someone. Sometimes I don't know what to tell my grad students when, I, when they sort of ask for advice about the poetry landscape right now. I just say, honestly, this is the most opaque it's been for me in a long time. So I'm curious for you as someone who is, up there, right, and seeing, as you're saying, you know, so much, right? Just where, 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 where or what type of poetry do you think has the nation's attention right now? Like, what, what do you think is coming? What do you think is in the moment? Just, like, what is it? That's, I'm, I'm with you. Um, 
I, I felt that same way. I felt that way since I walked into the building, that there's so much happening. There are more poets writing right now than there have ever been. These are just statistical facts. There are more people reading poems. There are more people submitting poems. This is just, in this moment, like poetry feels like it's blossoming in a different kind, in a different way, right? Because there's so many people trying to do it. But at the same time, we have fewer resources supporting our art than we ever had. There are fewer people buying books and reading those books, but they're writing. So there are a lot of there are a lot of kind of conflicting factors happening. Um, we get something like five million visitors to the Poetry Foundation archive a month. Um, it unique visitors, and Robert Frost is still the number one like you know poet who people go to. Gwendolyn Brooks, um, Maya Angelou, and Rudyard Kipling for it. I don't know who that that poem. That poem is still like in top five of things that people go to. I'm mentioning this because it's disaggregated. Like they're not going to the book that, that Maya Angelou, they, they go to that one poem. And some of that's because people are teaching those one poems, but it's the same way people buy music. It's the same way that they, they, they consume um, visual arts. You know, nobody goes and looks at the big folio of a, of a painting of art. They go and find the one piece that they, they admire. And I think the difference is, and this is not even a, it's not a critique, it's just an observation, that, is that the way people find work is different, and so the way they consume it is different. When you had to pick up a book or get one of these from a teacher or a friend to be able to find a poem, that, there's a different excavation in that than there is when you know, if you look it up on the Poetry Foundation, there's you know there's three or four poems by that poet, and those are the ones that people know. You know? Um, in some ways, I think that it, it makes, it's, it's limiting unless you have the, the, the like inherent curiosity to want to go and do a di that other kind of work, or have been taught to do that other kind of work because they don't always teach it that way anymore either. Um, but what it's led to is poetry that I think starts with identity in a different way than it used to. I think that there's a kind of, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a different kind of politics. You're saying poetry that starts with identity. Yeah. Is mine. Why don't you just? Okay. Well, you know, I'll just, I'll just turn this way, <laughs> and yeah, we'll just, we'll share this like a, this, this baby microphone. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, I think that that it's like kind of the way that people receive poetry as individual poems and not like the body of work or the the shape of the like a larger conversation for a poet is led to people kind of writing inward in a different way. So identity becomes a different part of poetry where one positions themselves like aesthetically. Like I'm a, I'm a poet of the, this, kind of like this kind of movement. I'm a poet, a performance poet. I'm a, a poet who only writes in form. Like there's a kind of um, a need to frame the work differently because people only, you're, you have one shot. Somebody might find this one poem. Um, and that's a different kind of pressure. You know, I mean, it's a different kind of pressure for readers. It's a different kind of pressure for the poets. Um, and so we see a ton of work that's kind of doing that, that's trying to position a writer inside of the larger poetry conversation. And it that was the same when we were coming up, but it would be a book that did that, not one poem. And so I feel really, I have a, a great deal of sympathy for young poets right now because they, they have a different kind of pressure than we had. And I think it's also tied to the, the grand successes that some young poets have had. And we were talking about this earlier. Like there are young poets, when I was coming up, if you were lucky to get some, uh, like a sniff from the National Book Awards, it was like your fourth book or your fifth book. You'd be in your 40s somewhere, had been around doing this kind of work. But now people from a, with a book that was started as their thesis will win a big prize like that. So what does that do for the other poets who are just starting out and seeing that kind of success? Does it suggest that they're not succeeding because they don't get that same thing? You know, I think it does for some poets. I think that's how they receive it. When I was a teacher, I tell them all the time that, you know, this is a very, very long game. 
like the best poets figure out their how to be their best selves when they're in their like 60s you know they don't figure it out when they're 25 you know you know your brain hasn't even fully formed yet how are you supposed to be able to write the best poems you could write at that age um, it has to build it requires a very very long gaze um, but it's hard to share that with someone when so many other things are immediate in you know in their in their circles you know yeah so I don't know if that's a real answer to it but I because I'm just this is like a great deal of sympathy for poets yeah, no, I, I, I see the same thing um, and that's just for me now the question is like where it's going mm -hmm. and I guess we'll, we'll know in five years <laughs> um, everyone please thank again Adrian Matika for being with us tonight Thank you to Marianne, thank you to the Hill Center, thank you to you all for coming out on a, a chilly night for a spirited conversation. And hopefully we'll see some of you again in the new year as we continue. So happy holidays and have a good night. <laughs>